What's going on, Discovery family? Can you believe it that we are three weeks in to our homeschool series? Already, we're, we're looking at the book of Proverbs and allowing what King Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs and what he compiled in this book to teach us some life lessons. It's so cool to see as we read the impact that it can have on our lives today, a book that was written thousands of years ago, still to bring significant value to our lives. Over the past couple of weeks, we've alluded to the fact that some of the most valuable lessons that we learn in life are actually the hardest lessons to learn, the ones that hurt a little bit. You know, we didn't like it in the moment, but years down the road, we were so thankful that somebody said something or taught us something or we learned something because it actually made us a better person. So this is our pre-warning for today. Today's lesson is one of those. It's going to make us squirm in our seat a little bit. It's going to make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. But it's an important lesson to learn today because it's going to make us a way better person in the future. Today... We're going to talk about our words, the power of our words, the power of speech. The book of Proverbs has has somewhere in the ballpark of 130 verses that allude to speech, that talk about speech. Proverbs talks about speech so much. Here's a couple, just a couple verses of, of Proverbs to get us going. Proverbs 12, 18, it says, careless words stab like a sword, but the words of the wise bring healing. And then there's 18 and 21. It says, the tongue has the power of life and death. So right from the top, I want to ask us a question. And I want you to be honest with yourself. What kind of person do you want to be? What kind of person do I want to be? Someone that brings life and healing? Or someone that brings death? Because if we make a decision today, what kind of person we want to be, we put steps in place to become that person. Now, I, I, I know a lot of people that are tuning in, and you know, we've got to know some of you new since we've started only online. But I think you're a good person. And, and if, even, even if we're a little rough around the edges, I think deep down inside, we want to bring life. We want to be people that bring life. Because we all know what it's like to be on the receiving end of someone's reckless words. Whether or not you're living in Edmonton or Newfoundland, Toronto, Boston, LA, Japan, wherever in the world you're watching from, we all have a story. And it's a story of, of somebody, someone that said something recklessly to us that cut like a sword. And we still have scars or wounds. And sometimes those scars are bigger. Or those wounds are, are much deeper. But we all have a story of someone's reckless words hurting us. And unfortunately, some of those words came from individuals who are supposed to be the closest to us, the people that we love the most. It might have been a parent or a sibling, a best friend. In many cases, a spouse. Now, it's unfortunate as a part of our, our fallen nature that some of the meanest things that we'll ever say is actually going to be said to the people that are closest to us and dearest to us. It's unfortunate. We all have those wounds. But the opposite is true as well. The tongue of the wise, Proverbs says, brings healing. Have you ever received a word of encouragement? Maybe from a coach, a parent, a spouse, teacher, someone you admire, someone that believed in you, someone that uplifted your spirits in that time, and and, and those words were just what you needed to hear, that those words of hope, just keep going. You're worth it. You got it. 
know, the person that's speaking those words may have never known it, but it was just what you needed to hear at just the right time. You know, in that moment where you were down and lonely, depressed, out on your luck, somebody just came into your life and spoke a word of encouragement that just kept you moving forward. How did they do that? See, some people would reach for a a pill or a substance or some other coping mechanism to uplift people's spirits, but they brought a word of encouragement. They uplifted your life. They brought life to you through their words. That's the power of speech. Like I said, Proverbs talks extensively about speech, and there's, there's no way that we can actually cover it all in one message. Well, we could. I could. We could be here for six hours, but we figured let's only make it two hours. No, let's bring it down a little bit shorter than that. But we could do a whole series around this. We could talk about the destructiveness of lying, impure talk, breaking confidence, or, or telling people's secrets, complaining and grumbling. Proverbs has so much to say about speech, and it's important to understand the power that is held in our tongue. Our speech is something, church, family, friends. If you're watching today, maybe you're catching this message three years from now, maybe you're catching it on a podcast. Our speech is something that we have to pay close attention to. We've we've got to. We we have to. Get get this. Proverbs 16, uh, Proverbs, sorry, Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 says this. This is a hard few verses. It says, There are six things that the Lord hates, even seven that are disgusting to him. Arrogant eyes, so looking down on people and thinking you're better than everybody else. A lying tongue, speech. Hands that kill, the, kill innocent people. A mind devising wicked plans. Feet that are quick to do wrong. A dishonest witness spitting out lies, speech. And a person who spreads conflict among relatives. I think number seven, speech as well. Because what's the number one way that we, that people, spread conflict among relatives? Gossip. Gossip. Church, we have to be more aware of how Satan tries to get a foothold into our lives. And one of the ways that he gets a foothold into our lives is trying to trick us to not pay attention to our speech. See, if he can get us not paying attention to our speech, then we're losing a big portion of our witness. And we're allowing disunity to come into our bodies. Honestly, one of the biggest footholds that Satan has in our lives is through gossip. You know what? Most of you, or some of you watching today, you don't struggle with alcoholism or drug addiction or pornography or out sleeping around or some other name, whatever sin you want to put in there. But for many of us, our sin of choice is gossip. For many of us, our sin of choice is gossip. And now before you get all defensive, because when we hear hard words, the reality of it is our humanists want to get all defensive. We want to point, push it off and we want to shut down. But before we get all defensive and you go out and you talk about me or say something about me, See what I did there? That's gossip. Let's just look at it for a moment. 
could we just admit that not gossiping or listening to gossip is easier said than done. We can read it and agree with it, but it's not that easy. But if we can admit that, that not gossiping or not listening to gossip is, is not very easy and, and that maybe I have an issue with it, maybe it's in my life and I don't want it there, maybe Satan has a foothold in my life through gossip, but I don't want it there. If we can just admit to that, that's the first step to recovery and admitting that we have a problem with it. Gossip is so destructive. You, you know it. It's destroying families and marriages and friends, workplaces. Gossip is even destroying our churches. Not just Discovery Church. This is not a message just for us as Discovery Church. This is a message for us as believers. Gossip is destroying the church. Gossip wreck havoc and destroy anything in this path. And we get trapped in it. We get trapped in it and not even know that we're trapped into it. And we continue to allow our tongue to be loose. And maybe we don't even allow our tongue to be loose, but we allow other people's tongue to be loose in our presence. What I've come to understand about gossip is that it does a really good job at hiding itself. See, I think that's why God added it in to these seven things that they test him. Because if it wasn't so strong in there, then maybe we would never notice it. See, gossip wants to hide itself and disguise itself in good intentions. Or in sayings like this, well, if it's true, it's not gossip. Or, well, everybody knows it anyway, so I'm just restating what everybody knows. Or, or, or I, I've seen it done like this before, where gossip is actually disguised behind a spiritual mask. And this is, this is what we say. Hey, did you, did you see Johnny... At the police station. I was driving by the police station on, on Saturday and I seen Johnny walking out with his, with his mom. I wonder what happened. I, I bet it was so, such and such thing. I mean, I'm just so concerned for him. I'm going to be praying for him. We should be praying for him because Johnny, you know what? If he doesn't shape up, he's going to be headed down a wrong road. Right? We, we disguise it behind a prayer request. Or, or, or our spiritual face to try, to try to get information about people, but masking it as though we're the spiritual person in this. Or at times, I've heard this one. Hey, Pastor Lauren, how's, how's, how's Susie and Billy doing? I've I seen that. I seen that Susie changed her, her status on Facebook to it's complicated. And are, are they still, still together? Because you know what? I, I've just been praying for their marriage. How are they doing? Well, if Susie and Billy want you to know about their marriage, they'll tell you personally. We don't go fishing for it under this spiritual mask. Did you hear about Johnny's son? I can't imagine how Johnny's feeling. He must be so disappointed. Me as a parent, I, I, oh, he must be so disappointed. Proverbs 10. eighteen says this. Whoever conceals hatred as lying lips Whoever spreads slander is a fool. So not only does God hate gossip, the Bible 
is calling us a fool if we gossip. Over one page to Proverbs 11, 9. With his talk, a godless person can ruin his neighbor, but righteous people are rescued by knowledge. Anybody in a neighborhood where someone's reputation is ruined? How does that happen? Usually by gossip. Usually by one neighbor talking to another neighbor. You know, a, a, a new neighbor moves in and the first thing you go over is to start a conversation about so-and-so who's next door and you talk it about them. Gossip. Proverbs 16, 27 says this. A worthless person plots trouble and his speech is like a burning fire. A devious person spreads quarrels. A gossip separates the closest of friends. Now, I know you don't have to think very far or look very far, and it might be even you personally. That you're no longer friends with somebody because of gossip. A family that is not together on the holidays anymore. Why? Because of gossip. You know, something that happened 15 years ago in junior high, we still can't get past because of gossip, because we keep talking and we keep adding fuel to the fire and we keep saying it over and over and over and over and we keep talking bad about that person. Let's keep going. Proverbs 17, 4. It says, an evil, an evil doer pays attention to wicked lips. A liar opens his ears to a slanderous tongue. See, up to, up to this point, some of us were like, well, I, I don't go around talking about people, and I try really hard not to talk about people. But Proverbs 17 and 4, I think, this, I think everybody that's listening today actually might fall at, at times into this category. Proverbs 17, 4, let me read it again. An evildoer pays attention to wicked lips. A liar opens his ears to a slanderous tongue. See, this, this verse is saying you don't, you don't have to be the one that actually says the words or gossips, but, 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 but wait now. This verse is saying, even if you listen, even if you open your ears to slanderous talk, you go out to a restaurant after church with some friends, and the first thing that gets talked about is so-and-so's dress code on a Sunday morning. And as your, as your friends or family are talking about it, you're just, you're just staying there quiet. Instead of shutting it down, we're just sitting there quietly, saying nothing, with our heads down, thinking, you know what, I'm going to stay out of this. When really, an evildoer pays attention to the wicked lips. And our ears are open to slanderous thoughts. Or what, 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 about, what about those of us who get on the phone with our friends or an aunt and we're like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. You know, it's Aunt Betty that calls you and goes off about, about your Uncle Rick. Did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear about Rick's daughter? They're getting a divorce. 
Did you hear about Cousin Sally? They're losing their house to bankruptcy and, 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 and your Aunt Betty keeps going and going and going and you're just, uh-huh, yeah, and you're rolling your eyes. You're, you're not in agreement with it, but you're listening. You're, uh-huh, yeah, Aunt Betty, uh-huh, uh-huh. Proverbs 17, 14, an evil doer pays attention to wicked lips. A liar opens his ears to a slanderous tongue. Man, this lesson that we're learning today is hard. But if we can actually grasp it and learn it and lean into it, it might just be the most important lesson of our lives. Our lives will be so much better our church, not just Discovery, but, but like our capital C nationwide, worldwide church would be so much better if we can just stop the gossip. So I ask you this question. Don't go pointing fingers at other people. Don't go pointing fingers at people that you think may have said something to you. But have you said something about someone else to tear them down? Or maybe you've said something about yourself to make your, make, or something about yourself or about somebody to make you be the bigger, better person in a situation. And like I said, Naturally, we're going to want to point fingers. So, so and so did this to me, and this person said that, and I wasn't there, and, and they did or said, or I heard that they said this about me. Don't point fingers. What about yourself? Gossip will wreck lives, will wreck marriages, will wreck families, will, will, will wreck friendships, will wreck the church. I, I felt as I was, I was praying and preparing for this message that I, uh, that, that we, that you need permission today to shut it down. You have permission as, as I'm the, I had the privilege of being the pastor of Discovery Church. You have permission to shut down gossip. Aunt Betty, you know what? I love you, but if you want to, if you want to talk about the Raptors or the Oilers or the Blue Jays or what's happening in West Edmonton Mall, I would talk to you. But we're not going to talk about people anymore. But 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 but, but I'm just wanting to let you know. No, Aunt Betty, we're not talking about people anymore. You have the permission to shut it down. Can I actually give permission to children and teenagers for a moment? There's going to come a time in the life of discovery as we continue to grow that we're going to hire staff. And one of the staff hirings in the future will be a youth pastor. Now, I used to be a youth pastor. Children, teenagers, if your parents ever start talking bad about your youth pastor in a slanderous way, in a way that is not uplifting, around the dinner table, I give you permission to shut it down. Parents, could we, me included, be humble enough to recognize our words and our speech as doing more destruction than good? Parents, your dinner table is not the place to rip people down. Your dinner table is not the place to trash teachers and pastors and police officers and government leaders. The dinner table, I think, should be a sacred place. What happens at the dinner table gets rooted in our lives. I remember at a previous church that I had the honor to be on staff, I was cornered by a church member when I was a youth pastor. And this particular church member started going off about our lead pastor. They were very displeased and didn't like him. And this is what they said to me, to try to, try to bait me in. And this is what gossip does. It tries to bait you in to take the hook. It says, oh, 
Pastor Lauren, you know what? Our church would be so much better if you were leading it. And then they kept on going off, and I said, whoa, 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 we got to stop. Have you ever talked to our lead pastor about this? No, 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 no. Well, you know what? Instead of us continuing to talk about him, let's go to his office, and let's talk to him personally. Guess what happened? It got shut down. Now, they weren't big enough individuals to go to his office, but I wasn't allowing it into my life. See, when we allow gossip or we gossip, we're not honoring people, and God wants us to honor people. See, we're all God's children. We have to let people know that we're not listening anymore. If you have an issue with somebody, you need to go talk to them. I'm not going to be your trash can. I'm not going to be the person that you want to come to every time you have an issue with so-and-so or so-and-so and so-and-so. Proverbs 18, 8 says this. The words of a gospel are, swa- are swallowed greedily. Sorry, the words of a gossip are swa- swallowed greedily, and they go down into a person's innermost being. See, it's not going to be easy to shut it down. It's actually not going to be easy to get rid of in our lives. It's going to be like little dainty morsels. Now, morsels are little pieces of food. Does anybody like popcorn? Friday nights in our home is family night. And on occasions, what will happen is that we'll do a movie and a popcorn for family night. Now, I don't, I don't love popcorn, but if Sean Lee makes popcorn for the kids, I'll have a little bowl of it. And then when my bowl is gone, I might even, you know, reach over to Sophia and grab a piece of hers and her Hudson's, and they get, they get mad. It's like, Dad, you had your own. Yeah, you had your own. You could have had some. And I eat the popcorn, and I remember why I don't like popcorn that much. And it's not necessarily for the taste. It's those little pieces of the kernel that get stuck, stuck in the back of your tooth. There's the little morsels of food that get stuck in the back, and you try to get it out, and you go and brush your teeth, and you still feel it there, but you then go to sleep, and you wake up the next morning, you brush your teeth, and you kind of got, just got used to the, the feeling of this little morsel or kernel that's stuck back here, and a couple days go by, and you, you're like, ah, oh, man, my, my tooth and my gum really hurts, and then you remember, oh, right, I still have that popcorn kernel way down there, and you have to work at it to get it out. It's wedged in there, and you like, even floss is not getting it out, and ah, you got to work at it. That little morsel begins to get really uncomfortable, and you work at it, and work at it, and work at it, and work at it, and guess what? That's what rumors are like. That's what gossip is like. Little kernels that sink deep. And once it's there, we have to work hard at getting it out. And you know what's crazy is that lots of times the rumors that are spread about people, even when they're not true, can still taint and ruin somebody's character. Now, if that's ever happened to you, I just want you to know that, that God is the ultimate viewer of character. So he'll, he'll still allow you to win in the end if somebody has spread a rumor about you. You, you, you leave that to God. Don't... don't harbor bitterness or unforgiveness towards people. But if we're the rumor carrier, if we know if we've listened to it, then we have to work hard on getting those little morsels that have sunken deep into our hearts out. See, there's some things that make us godly. And there are other things that seem to make us more godless. 
and the need to know and the need to tell seems to make me more godless than godly. And gossip is one of those things that just seem to take a root, that Satan gets a foothold into your life. And it's a slippery, slippery slope. It's a trap. It's a scheme of the enemy to try to bring disunity. Specifically the Christians, to those individuals that have made a decision to follow Jesus up to this point. Christians, gossip is our sin of choice. And I hope that shakes you a little bit. I hope that, that it makes you tremor a little bit. I hope that makes you live in the fear of the Lord that we talked about the first week. That gossip is our sin of choice, and God is not okay with it. You know, if, if when we talk about someone and they're not present, and it's not building them up, then it's gossip. And I, I have personally used this one before, and I had to repent before God and, and ask for forgiveness. And, and I've, I've used this before. Well, it's not gossip if I would say it when they're in the presence. Well, I'll tell, put it this way. Wait until they're in the presence to say it, because how you will say it will probably change its tone and its wording. And it's not wrong to have a constructive criticism or be on, in, on somebody's side so much that you love them so much that you're willing to tell them something that is not so glamorous about themselves. But usually, gossip has the end result of making me feel better about myself by putting other people down. Gossip can even exist if it is true. Sometimes we're like, well, it's true, so it's not gossip. Well, sometimes someone else's truth is not your truth to tell. I say that. Somebody else's truth is not your truth to tell. What if somebody's marriage is on the rocks and, 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 it's, and, and they're on the verge of divorce? But that's not your truth to tell. Don't go around spreading all that about people. Somebody else's truth is not your truth to tell. And on the flip side, I would say don't allow other people to use you as a trash can. Because you know it, if people are talking to you about others, that same person is talking about others, or talking to others about you. And what would you want somebody to do if someone came to them and were lying about them, or gossiping about them, or gossiping about yourself? What would you want, what would you want a friend to do? You'd want them to shut it down. And the way to shut down gossip is to don't add any wood to the fire. You know, if you want a fire to keep going, what do we do? We put fuel to it. We put fire to it. We put kindling to it. Gossip is a fire that's raging in our lives, that can rage in our churches, that can rage in our workplaces. But we have the choice not to add wood to the fire. Now, are you tired of the same old stories? The same old, old feelings from 15 years ago? Do you wish that your family would be unified again, that you could spend Christmas together? Stop the gossip. Shut down the gossip. And in some cases, we might need to shut our mouths. I know that's hard to hear. But read through Proverbs. Our tongue is powerful. Our speech is strong.
church in our world today, one of the major places that we find a gossip is right here. I ask you a question. How are you doing? How are you doing online? How are you doing on social media? Are you just using it to tear people down? What are you spreading? And what are you listening to? How you doing? How you doing on, online? There's nothing that will bring disunity like gossip. And the Bible's clear that we need to be a unified church. Here's what happens when we're a unified church. The world takes notice. The world takes notice. The very people that Jesus came and died for begins to notice something different in the lives of those who accepted Jesus' death and understood his resurrection to be a way to have a relationship with God. And in our unity, people take notice. See, we need to be a church that is welcoming to those who are struggling sexually. We need to be a church that is welcoming alcoholics, welcoming drug addicts. We need to be a church who are welcoming to those who are disrespectful. But we cannot be a church that welcomes gossip. Like I said earlier on, I was in youth, youth ministry for a while, for approximately 10 years. And I saw teenagers that were struggling in all those areas, struggling sexually, addicted to substance abuse, challenged with respect of authority, and the list goes on. But they would come to church, to youth group, because they felt safe. If you're watching online today and you're struggling with any of those things, I, pr I hope that you can come to Discovery and find a safe place. You know the one thing that makes somebody not feel safe? Gossip. Gossip will break down any safe walls that somebody feels. Church needs to be the one place that everybody feels safe. But unfortunately, more often than not, church is the place that gossip is thriving. And church, we have to stop it. We have to nip it. We have to stop adding fuel to the fire. If it's not your truth to tell, don't tell it. If it's not uplifting somebody, then don't say it. Lock it down. The tongue is powerful. We just want to go out of Proverbs for one moment to conclude our message today. And to James 3, starting at verse 5, and it says this. In the same way that the tongue is a small part of the body, but it can brag about doing important things. A large forest can be set on fire by a little flame. The tongue is that kind of flame. It is a world of evil among the parts of the body and it, is completely, and it completely, completely contaminates our bodies. The tongue sets, fire, sets our lives on fire and is itself set on fire from hell. People have tamed all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures, yet no one can tame the tongue. This is an uncontrollable evil filled with deadly poison. I read that. And all I can see is, God, you've got to help me. 
that no human can control his tongue. Well, guess what? We serve a God who is bigger than humanity that can help us control our tongue. So the moment that we allow the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, that he's going to work on us. He's going to help me control my tongue. Why? Because people's lives depend on it. How, church, how important it is for us to guard and control our tongues. Proverbs 12, 18, careless words stab like a sword. Let's put down our swords. The words of the wise bring healing. Our world needs healing. Proverbs 18, 12, the tongue has the power to bring life or death. You choose. You want to be a life giver or a death bringer? I know which one I want. I want to be a life giver. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, today a hard lesson from Proverbs, one that may have us wanting to point fingers at others, but would we recognize that there's point, fingers pointed back at us? Help us tame our tongue. Help us guard our speech. Help us lock down the gossip. Today, Father, would you come into our hearts and help us in ways that we can't help ourselves and help us control our tongue. Help us stop gossiping. Help us not listen to gossip. In the name of Jesus, A. As you're listening today and reflecting, and maybe even feeling a little bit uncomfortable in your seat today, I want to ask you, maybe you're watching and you recognize, man, I have a problem with gossip. Maybe on the other hand, you, you, some people would say, I, I didn't think I had a problem with gossip, but I really have a problem listening to gossip. I want to be like that, that compassionate listening ear when somebody has a, a problem, and I want to, you know what, I thought that was the godly thing to do, but the truth is that that's, how, that's how gossip is disguising itself. We need God's help. We need God's help to get rid of gossip in our lives, in our church, in our world. Because there's a dying world out there that needs to see unity. If you have a problem with gossip and you've never given your life to Christ before, you will continue to have the problem because as a human, we can't tame our tongue. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives and us surrendering our lives and our tongues to the Holy Spirit that it will be controlled. So would you make that decision today? Would you pray a prayer that's simply saying, Holy Spirit, come into my life. Jesus, I accept you. In all my failures and mess-ups, I surrender them to you. God, would you come in and make my life new? Amen. A simple prayer like that. You just welcomed God into your life. And now it's going to help you lock it down. You know what? For some of us, you might need to take a moment to call somebody. You might need to apologize. Maybe you've been spreading rumors or saying things or uh, about people that was only intended to hurt them and to build yourself up, to make yourself look better. You need to apologize. Take today, take this moment, text them, call them, write a heartfelt letter, whatever it takes. Apologize in this moment. Discovery Church. It's a hard lesson. But I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you, brothers and sisters, for being honest and open and sitting through a hard but meaningful life lesson. I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. Thanks for taking the time to listen today. Have a great day. 
hey, if you made a decision today to give your life to Christ, we're celebrating with you. It's the best decision that you could ever make. But we don't want it just to be a one-day experience. We want to make sure we help you navigate the next steps in following Jesus. So if that's you, you made that decision today for the first time or a recommitment, would you scan the QR code or click the link in the comments section, and there you will find a connection card. And our team, they want to reach out to you. They want to be praying for you. They want to send you a Bible. I would love to reach out to you to see how you're doing because you know what we have to be a christian for ourselves but we can't be a christian by ourselves